Hey, hey, it's another go to unscripted. Welcome. I'm Eric Johnson. I'm a principal developer advocate from AWS. Ben, who are you? Hello, I'm Ben Smith. I'm also a principal developer advocate at AWS. Ben's a real principal developer advocate. He's, uh, and that's what we're talking to today. He knows his stuff. So, uh, how's your day going, Ben? Pretty good. Sunny here in England. 4 p.m. Oh, yeah. That's kind of a rarity, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So where are you? Tell them where you are. I'm in Brighton on the south coast of England, about 50 miles south of London. Nice. So now that there's, you said Brighton, so there's no T there, but there is a T in the spelling. Yes. And if you're, if you're posh, you say hope actually. Oh, I I don't know if I'm posh enough for that. I can go Brighton and that way, you know, I'm an American. Fine. So uh, anyway, uh, so we're going to get started here. Today we're going to be talking about, what really is go-to unscripted, which goes anywhere. So we talk about all kinds of things like where Ben lives and how to say Brighton and what posh the posh way. But we're also going to be talking about step functions. Uh, now, for folks who have never heard of step functions, they may also be called state machines. Uh, ben, can you kind of fill them in on what is it? Sure. I also like to refer to them as workflows because I think it's not another good one more easily to yeah. day-to-day stuff. Step function, That's the posh person. Sure. It's <laughs> a service on AWS that allows you to create workflows that consist of different steps or different states that orchestrate pretty much all the other AWS services and actions that are available. It's serverless. That's why we're talking about it, right? Because we're serverless DAs. It's fully managed. It's pay-per-use. And it's a really great way of building out serverless applications that orchestrate other AWS services. Okay, so let's kind of get into that for a second. So so this idea of orchestrating any other service on AWS, how, how does that work? So it works by using the SDK of that service. So let's say you want to invoke a Lambda function, right? There's an action or a state that you can use to invoke a Lambda function. Let's say you want to get the result or the response of that Lambda function and you want to persist that to a DynamoDB table. Well, then you can use the put object for the DynamoDB action. And you can add decisional logic. So you can create if branches. You can use parallel statements so you can run these different branches concurrently. You can have dynamic map states. So maybe you don't know how many inputs you're going to have for a particular array. You can uh, you can make that dynamic so you can run things in parallel dynamically and you can add fail states, you can catch errors, you can retry errors and you start to get really robust workflows for building out your serverless applications. So it's really cool about, about state machines, workflow step functions. Uh, yeah. I, 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 and, and I do the same thing. I kind of change what I'm talking about. What's really cool about this workflow um, and, and you hit on a lot of that. So a lot of what you were saying, like, like uh, you know, uh, ch- if thens and switches, and uh, it, it's really interesting to me if you kind of think about code. Uh, and and I have code. I have, and I think you call it spaghetti string code. Uh, which, spaghetti which, code, uh, yeah, spaghetti code, yeah, spaghetti string. Okay, yeah, spaghetti code. And yeah, and I totally see it because I've had code that's you know it's it's thirty lines long. Going if it's this, then do this. If it's this, then do this. If it's this, then do this. And then. When I get it all working, then I have to go back and write all the error code. If it's this, then do this, but if it's not, or if it failed, or if this, and then my code just gets bloated and long, right. and blah, you know, like that. Uh, and step functions kind of, kind of takes that all out for us, right? Yeah, exactly that. So what you're, what you've just described there is a uh, orchestration as code, right? You're building out a bunch of select or switch cases or if else statements that will do different things based on different inputs and outputs. Right. Imagine if you could visualize that as you're building it, right? Because what you're building really is an orchestrational workflow. So why not use a service that lets you understand that cognitive model visually? That's what Step Functions is. And that's exactly right. It's it's interesting to me when I almost fell over there. So keep an eye on me. I couldn't fall over. Uh, It's interesting uh, when we talk to folks, some pushback that I've seen on Step Functions like, I don't want to do all that logic. It's like, but you already are. 
you're already doing it, you know, in, in a way that, and, and it's making you do more than that because you have to handle retries. You have to handle errors. You have to, you, code is logic, right? And so, uh, that, that's, people ask me, when should I use state functions? And we're, we're going to get to that because, because there's a pretty good answer on that. And, and it, and it gets further along as, as we've added more to step functions. But my answer is if you find a lot of the spaghetti code in, in your, in your functions, uh, or in your lambda functions, if you find yourself writing a lot of logic, uh, routing, I call it routing logic, routing right. logic versus, versus, you know, business logic. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, super. Well, sorry. So I want to step back to something you said earlier. Um, so before, so several years ago, and I, you'll, I, I don't remember the, it, it all kind of, I'm old, it all runs together. Several years ago, it used to be in a state machine. You had about nine integrations, right? We integrated with DynamoDB, things like that. If you wanted to integrate with anything else, then you had to use a Lambda function. So you would invoke a Lambda function. It would use the SDK to talk to something and get that information back, then kick it back into the, to the workflow. But we changed that. Kind of go into the, to the SDK. I know you talked about it a little bit earlier, but how does that help? Sure. So I think it's only been about three years that we've had this feature, right? So before this, this feature you would use something called that we now call an optimized integration. So this could work with things like S3, DynamoDB, Lambda, I forget which other ones there are. Um, and what this does is it kind of obfuscates a little bit for you the parameters that you need to set for the action, right? It's sort of a more tidy, neat way of doing it. But what we found is that developers needed to do way more than use these nine services. They needed to, I don't know, send things to IoT core, right? Spin right. up an ETS task. It's pretty much anything that you want to do on AWS, you, you need to be familiar with the SDK. And so what we found is that developers were creating a Lambda function. And in that Lambda function, they would pull in the requirement for the SDK, maybe as a layer or in a, a package dependency, depending on your runtime. They would pull in that SDK. They would write their 10, 20 lines of code to run that SDK action and handle the response. And they would send that response back from their Lambda function. They would call that Lambda function from step functions, right? So what this meant is a few things. The first is that you're getting a cold start if you're triggering that Lambda function for the first time in a while. You're getting an invocation cost and you have to wait for that Lambda function to return its response. And you have all this code, this extra code to manage, which really all you're doing is calling an SDK on another service. You're using the Lambda function as kind of glue code. You've got to manage the security permissions for your function to be able to do this thing. And you're adding complexity to your application. You're adding latency, complexity, and cost, right? And then you're orchestrating that inside a workflow. So what we did in the Step Functions team is they made a way for you to call many, many of these other actions and these services directly from within the step functions substrate. So the step function service itself is responsible for performing that SDK action, whether it's spinning up an ECS task or sending a message to an IoT core topic. You still have to configure your workflow with the action permissions required to do that thing. So it's still nice and secure but you will eliminate the cold start times required from Lambda. You will eliminate the invocation costs that might be required from Lambda. And you eliminate all those lines of code that you would need That's to right. manage if you would manage that or handle that using a Lambda function, right? I remember sitting, uh, I don't know if I've told you story or not, but I was sitting with, with uh, Justin Callison, who's he's, uh, in charge of, of a lot of step functions. And he... Uh, when they explain this to me, and this was really one of those, I mean, literally my jaw physically dropped open. It was like, first of all, that, that's brilliant. Whoever went, you know what? Let's just use the existing SDK. I was like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Uh, because here, you know, inside Amazon, when we add features, things like that, the SDKs are automatically updated. One of the first things updated, right? We have a lot of automated process wrapped around that. We have Smithy and we have, you know, things that are going on there. And so, so that allows or enables step functions just to automatically take that. And, and the interesting thing here is, is a lot of times we think we're just passing. Look here. So when I use it, when I use a transition, here's the JSON. So that configuration you're talking about, well, you were talking about the configuration state, but also inside, you still have to tell it, Hey, 
here's the DynamoDB table. Here, there's some JSON that would have to do just like you would do in a Lambda function. Yeah. But like, but then it handles the signed request to the service. It handles all that, uh, you know, behind the scenes. And it's, it's just, it was brilliant. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. I was so excited about it. Uh, and it's good to see him do that. And so, and so step functions went from seven, nine, uh, direct connections to, uh, and you said the number before. What's the number now? I think it's 220 services plus and. I think that gives us about eleven thousand actions at this point. That's right. And so, when you if you if you've never seen the Workflow Studio, um, in in, in hopefully we'll, we'll get a picture of that up or, or we'll get a link to it. Uh, it's inside of your your AWS account. Or and I'm just going to throw this out here because I've actually been using it quite a bit. If you use App Composer locally in your IDE, you can open a workflow locally and edit the it locally. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, so I've been doing that quite a bit. So check that out. So you can drag those in and you can just search through all those. You go, Oh, what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to put, put item in, in DynamoDB, put item, you know, and, and there it is. So, well, hang on. We just jumped over a bunch of stuff there. Some big I stuff. Did. Oh, right. Big, okay. big launches from back in November. So, um, going back a year, I would imagine there's many people that are not using or don't know about the capabilities of App Composer. It might be worth right. explaining that a little bit. Yeah, so App Composer is, uh, it's just that. It's an application composer, and they're, and they're doing some really cool stuff. It's, it's going really fast. So they came out, it's very limited, and we knew that. You know, hey, we're going to put it out limited, see what people think. Uh, and, and what it was is inside your AWS console, you, would, you could open App Composer, and you have this blank canvas, and you would have a selection, mostly serverless, uh, selection of services that you could drag and drop. And here's what's really cool is when you would drag on, let's say I drag on API Gateway, and then I drag on a Lambda function. I want to invoke that uh, Lambda function from API Gateway. One of the really cool things is is App Composer will deal, the thing that Ben was just talking about, it will deal with the creating the IAM roles. It will deal with the Lambda permissions too, because because an API Gateway cannot invoke a Lambda function out of the box. You have to give it permission because everything's locked down. We, we need these privileges. So if you drag it on there, the minute you connect them with a the little connector, I, I'm doing that if you can see it. If you connect with the little connector, App Composer creates the, and it's very verbose so you can read it, it creates these connectors for you that gives you least privileges. Hey, they can invoke Lambda functions. So they handle all that. It also sets up your logging. I mean, it's, it, 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 it does a lot behind the scenes. So it's like a, a best practices way of connecting one service to another. And what it's, all it's really doing is building up the infrastructure as code That's template right. that you can copy off and, you know, place into your, your Git repositories, right? And then deploy the application. It's building up that, right. that template for you. Right, but now you don't even have to copy it. It connects locally to your hard drive from right. the from the console. So it builds SAM. So if you're not familiar, if you use CDK, we don't support that at the moment. Uh, but you know, keep keep your ears open. But it it, it builds a SAM template. Uh, and then now uh, this year, and, and tell me if I'm missing other stuff, Ben. But this year we released a IDE plugin for VS Code. So in VS Code, if you have uh, the the uh, AWS toolbox, and you have an, a SAM template up in the top right corner. You'll see a little uh, it's it's a little icon. I, I I can't even describe it, but it's a little icon you see at the top right that allows you to open that in uh, App Composer. And then if you have a step function in there, and this is what drove this whole point, if you have a step function in there, you can say edit step function, and it brings the workflow studio to your desktop. I I love it. Uh, it's really cool. I I've, I've not used this much yet. Okay. I only wait like early times just before it was launched and you know, we get some early access to things sometimes. Um so what that allows you to do is to have Workflow Studio in your IDE with with all the same actions that you can search for and browse and drag in, build out your workflow, right? That's right. That's right. So the interesting thing here is is they're not recreating the the um workflow editor in, in the local, they're actually pulling it down. So if it changes up here in the console, cool. it gets updated locally. So yes, it's a, it's an exact replica. You, you know, you were saying how App Composer 
kind of rearranges your file system for you in real time as you're dragging yeah. things in. This scared the heck out of me the first time I used it. I, I <laughs> opened up a real project that was already in production and thought, oh, yes. I wonder what happens if I drag this over here. And <laughs> my entire template. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, yeah. yeah I, so, and that's something where there's a couple things that go on. And to be honest, that we're working on one. The other thing it does, is, like you said, you drop a lambda function on what creates the, fu the, the function for you, yeah. but it never deletes the function. So let's say, you know okay. what? I, I don't want that to be Node. I want it to be Python. It's going to create a new Lambda function and change it to Python because we don't want to destroy any work you've already done. So, so it will it will create the, you know, let's say I create a new Node Lambda function. It creates an app.js file and, and the handler ready for me to type into and yep. all of that stuff. That's, yeah. pretty, that's pretty amazing. I need to check back in to uh, try that out. Yeah, yeah. It, you're wrong. Even over the last, since reInvent this year, they've had, they've come, uh, they've come a long way with that. And, and I have constant conversations when, because I use Sam all the time. I'm not smart enough to use some of the other ones, but I use Sam all the time. And, and, and we, uh, you know, it, it, they, they take feedback constantly. So if you're using, if you have, if you have feedback or something's going on, let me know. Because they automatically start working on that stuff. So it's, it's a good team and they're working fast to take care of it. Let's get back to step functions for a minute. We've, we've, we've been, I, well, all right, let's tell the truth. It was Eric who was running on the rabbit hole. But, uh, so I want to come back to step functions. I'm going to ask you a question here. Um, okay. Do, do you think every single workload should start with step functions? Oh, I think you need to consider why you wouldn't start with step functions, right? Oh, okay. I, I always, I always, when I approach a new project or a new build, I think, what's a good reason not to use step functions? And it's quite difficult to come up with yeah. that sometimes. Sometimes you're building something so simple or something that really does require a lot of custom code. Maybe it doesn't lean into this service-driven approach as right. heavily. That's a good reason perhaps not to use step functions. But I think anything that is consisting of multiple AWS services that need to pass data across each other, I would almost always go with step functions first. Okay. How about you? Yeah. So I used to have this conversation. That, that there's this guy who used to work with this name, Rob Sutter. Do you remember Rob? I know that guy. Yeah. Oh, you know that guy. Okay. Yeah, Rob's a good guy. He he, And he used to always say, you should, I'm making myself, there we go. You should always... Always use step functions regardless. And I pushed back on him because when he was saying this, and we'll, and we'll kind of dig into some of the, some of the features of step functions. But when he was saying the step functions that were only standard step functions or standard workflows, and you could only invoke them asynchronously. Sure. So that, so at that point, it didn't make sense to start with step functions all the time. Yeah. That's a good pushback. Um, but. As you know, those yeah. two things, there's, there's different options now, right? So you're talking about invoking asynchronously, which is the standard workflow type, which right. it, it makes sense why you would invoke them only asynchronously because they can run for up to one year. So you don't want exactly. a service blocking hanging around no. for that response. Wheel. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But we've since introduced something called express workflows, right? Which transition through the states far more quickly. They only run for up to five minutes. They have a totally different billing model. So your build based on how long your workflow takes to complete at a different memory allocation. Whereas standard workflows are about how long or how many state transitions your workflow has. So that's good. So if you have a workload that does take years, but doesn't have loads and loads of state transitions, then that's a really effective cost model. But back to express workflows, I think the majority of step functions that I build are very quick, very short duration workflows, right? That just transition through a bunch of AWS services really quickly. And so yeah. having a, a cost model that's based on how long your workflow takes to complete makes a lot of sense for that. And these are the workflow types that you can invoke synchronously. So for example, you can trigger that from an API gateway call uh, to an endpoint that can run your workflow hang around for 29 seconds, which is the API gateway timeout limit, and right, return right. that response back 
to the the thing that called API Gateway, right? It's a really nice little pattern. Yeah, in fact, you have a pattern. If, if you're not familiar with serve, I, I know you are, but for those watching, if you're not familiar with serverless land, we have all these patterns and workflows out there. You have a pattern out there. I think I do too, but you got it first and yours is better. Uh, you have a pattern on using a, an express workflow for CRUD API, right? Yeah, I like this idea, right? So, so it's a, it's a bit against some principles that we speak about sometimes because what you're doing with this concept is you're, you're rooting any valid API call. So based on the, the path right. and the domain and the authentication, anything that's valid, you root on to your workflow. And then the first state in your workflow is a choice state that says based on the inbound request based on the parameters or the body or the method, which one of these branches should my workload take? And so what you're doing really is you're moving that routing mechanism into step well functions done. and taking it away from API Gateway. I know you don't like me saying the word routing. I don't mind it, but I, use, I just I make fun of you every time. And I was you ready, but it. you, okay. <laughs> you said, yeah. What is routing? What is, what is beta? It's the same as beta for, for you Americans or for those here, it's, it's routing and beta and all those things. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, and I love this. See, and I, and I, yeah, I agree with what you're saying, but again, this, this pattern of, you know, I, I do API gateway a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, and I love API, this pattern of API gateway being the front door and it's kind of your validations there, all, all kinds of stuff is happening there. And then you pass to this uh, step function and there's some advantages here that kind of interesting um, is, one, there's no cold start with this, with this, uh, express state machine. It's just there. It's, it's instant. It's running memory. It's fast. Um, two, uh, you have this drag and drop designer that, that we, we were talking about earlier. Uh, and, 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 and the cool thing is, is you do need a little VTL, uh, in API gateway to connect API gateway to step functions. Tiny yeah, bit. Just a tiny bit. Yeah. But both Sam and App Composer, because app composers work on top of Sam, will do that for you. So you can actually drag API gateway on, drag a step function in, set it to express, tell it and connect it, and off you go. Nice. So uh, if you haven't checked that out, it's worth checking out. Uh, but yes, this idea of now that you can do synchronous, because if you ever hear us talk, we're always saying asynchronous whenever possible. And I still believe that. We, we are big fans of... Uh, run asynchronous that allows you that gives you a lot of grace when you're building an application if, if something goes wrong you can recover and and then get the customer back the answer uh saves saves a lot of things but there are times when you just have to have a synchronous invocation and so when they open that up uh to me that was kind of the, the that was kind of like okay that seals the deal i go to step functions first all the time as well that's the first thing i do i, I open my app composer i drag my step function in, and then how am I going to invoke it? Well, an event bridge rule or an API gateway or something like that. Uh, and, and so Rob Sutter, you were ahead of your time. You were wrong then. You're right now, sir. I hope he sees this. I'll have to make sure he sees this. So, uh, but yeah, I, uh, that's what I love about, uh, you know, again, going, uh, going directly to step functions. You, you mentioned the, um, the synchronous asynchronous point there when, when you invoke from API gateway. And like often you'll have something that will be triggered from a webhook, for example, where you want to do some stuff in your AWS account. And you might want to use step functions for that, but you want to get the acknowledgement that your workflow is running straight away, right? So right. maybe it's triggering something via Slack or some other tool that you use day to day. You can still do that, right? You can still yeah. go API gateway to, I don't know, SQS or API gateway direct to step function and return that acknowledgement back to the caller. So I think it's worth pointing out, you still have that, that option as an express workflow as well. It's just, you, you get to pick now if you want to run that synchronously or asynchronously. Yeah, that's a good call. Uh, it, it does do the, yeah, you're right. It sends the acknowledgement. All of our asynchronous services send it and you can do a step function or you, yeah, you can do that. So a really good call out. All right. So Ben. What, let me ask you this. What's the coolest pattern you like in step functions? This, I'm going to tell you one in a minute that you did that I love, but go ahead. There's a couple. And you're probably going to take it now. <laughs> I think the most powerful one 
is this concept of this is what I think the cloud is all about and what serverless is all about is breaking down large workloads into smaller and smaller pieces that you can run concurrently, right? So you can wrap your head around too. Yeah. A- AWS has the, the economies of scale and the resources to be able to process things in parallel in a way that most businesses can't on their own, right? And with step functions, things like the dynamic map state, which allows you to concurrently branch out to 10,000 other workflows at the same time, right? That's out of the box. That's ready to go. So if you can break down a large task on a video processing, file processing into multiple smaller tasks, run them concurrently and then fan back in. So you have the fan out, the parallel execution, right. fan back in. I think this is the fundamental point of building applications using cloud services, using AWS and using serverless. So this is where I think step functions is really the key to the whole thing, right? Is orchestrating all of that in a workflow. That's my favorite pattern. No, and, and I agree with you. That's super powerful. The the distributed map. Uh, so we have an internal process that I run. It runs every six hours to to do features, things like that, and, and we we track stuff. And I, and I have to go through probably, you know, not a lot, really about a thousand records each time. Right. But I can do it in just seconds because I don't go one, then do this, then do this. It just so so. With that, and I'm going to tell you my favorite a little bit, I, I do want to go back to this. One of the patterns that I recommend, uh, and I want to see if you agree, and it's okay if you don't, you, you can be wrong. Um, one of the patterns that I tell folks, going back to, to, to the Express and Standard, I always start with Express, and I think you were kind of leaning for that. Nice. And then when I realized I need Standard, I swap it over to Standard, because it's just literally just as easy as saying type equals Express, type equals Standard, and ISC. Um, but one of the cool patterns that I like is I'll use an Express, and then I'll I'll um, invoke standards from that express as stub, uh, stub yeah. as sub. Oh, I'll invoke express ones as well. But this idea of kind of having, <laughs> you're really getting crazy in this. You have this master controller or main controller, and then you invoke these little ones. And I think you do that in the, on the um, plugins manager that we're doing uh, with the video. That's interesting. It's usually the other way around that we see people doing it is having like a master standard workflow that can yeah, run yeah. Like yeah, and then that, that, that calls out to lots of synchronous express workflows. Maybe it wants to wait for them to return a response or maybe not. Maybe they're, maybe they're asynchronous. But I think this is another really, really interesting pattern, right? Where you're embedding workflows within workflows. So you're using right. the durability, the, the, the state, um, length of up processing for up to one year of standard workflows. And then you're, you're using the speed and the different cost model of the duration based cost model True. of express workflows. And you can really start to grind out a, a really cost effective model when you start right. using the two things together. Yeah, that's right. And, and, uh, and, and that's what I recommend is start with express. And then when you need standard, and sometimes that standard, and especially if you're doing an ex, uh, express, you know, asynchronously, you need that standard. Uh, you need like, uh, so one of the features that are in standard, but not express is the wait for token, right? Yeah. And so maybe I kick that off asynchronously and move on and it completes that up. So I only have one state, one or two transitions in that standard. So I'm saving some money there and my express is moving on. So, so let, let's mention, so that's, that's my other favorite pattern is this wait for task token. So, oh, so what yeah. that allows you to do is to get to a step. And that step will do whatever it needs to do. So let's say that is putting something onto an event bus. Now, if you also choose to use this wait for task token pattern, then along with whatever payload it put onto your event bus, it will also generate a unique task token. And what that means is that your workflow will now pause at that state until it's told to resume. And the way you resume it is whenever that payload has triggered whatever it needs to trigger and that thing is finished, you grab that task token that hopefully you've stored somewhere and you use an SDK to call back to the workflow and say, okay, you can move on to the next step or throw an error and move on to a different step, right? And so this way we're able to use human approval steps, even multiple human approval steps, right? Maybe you have a, a process with lots of gates and lots of different people need to approve. Maybe one of them is a master approver that supersedes the others, and you can build all of this in using this simple, I think it's fairly simple, uh, wait for task token 
Pat seven. Once you wrap your head around it, and when you first look at it, it's like, oh, but then then when it clicks, it's like, that's the coolest thing ever. I use it. Uh, we built something for uh, reInvent for video pro- the video processing we're talking about. I, I yeah. built a plugin, and my plugin was using uh, AI through Adobe. It actually is calling an Adobe endpoint yeah. and, and doing some stuff. And so I had to wait for it. Uh, and, and this was, this is probably the first time I'd ever actually used task token in like a true, you know, I'd use it obviously conceptually a lot. And so it was just really cool. So I saved the token and I saved the job, the Adobe job in DynamoDB. So when the job came back, then I could map to the thing and then I just kicked it off again. It was, it was pretty slick. I love it. So that, that thing you built that was using Adobe to generate thumbnails using all sorts of interesting filters as a JSON yeah. file, right? So you, yep. were, you were posting out to Adobe from your workflow, waiting for that response. I think you gave them a signed uh, URL on S3. I did. For them, right? Yep. So that, that, gets up, that thumbnail gets uploaded to S3. The task token is then used to resume the workflow. I think it's a really neat pattern and building. It is. Uh, it is it, it, it's super powerful for those, for those pauses and for the waiting, to, you know, to, especially like the manual error, so like you mentioned earlier. So I'll tell you the one I like, and this is much simpler. Oh, it's none of them. But I know that's what I'm going to tell you. This oh, is this okay. is it. My favorite one, and I saw Ben do this once. And I remember looking at it going, "What's he doing?" I'll have to teach him how this works. And then I realized what he was doing. I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is brilliant!" Um, basically, the idea is so in step functions, when when you do a state, you can add, you can make the state. You know, you you can add it to the state. Kind of gets bigger. You say, "Okay, I'm going to get some results from the lambda function. I'm going to get some results from DynamoDB, and then kind of putting all that together." Oh, you, you add to the payload as it moves down. Right, you add to the payload. But sometimes you get something that comes in right at the beginning that you need right at the end. Now, yeah. you can pass it down, and it's sure. not that hard, but it's a little cognitive load of like, you know. Ben does a parallel. So when something comes in, he does a parallel state. He runs all the things he in the thing. He runs everything he needs to do on one side, and the parameter is saved all the way to the end and then i just have an array with all my results from this one and the parameter and i put that in and, and I, I, yes that's the simplest and maybe yeah. a lazy move but i think it's brilliant move and i use it i always the first thing i do is i drop a parallel and every time i build stuff on yeah i like that too because what you've done there is you've you've got like a global variable almost right, right. and it's ready for everything until you exit that parallel state so you can use it at any point more often than not, you get data on the on the initial call that you need to send back somewhere, right? You need you have a job ID, much like with Adobe or something like that. So, uh, and I've done it at little spots where I've had to come together and then I break it back out in the parallel again to continue to save. It. Yeah. So it's really what, cool what, patterns. What we really need is to get rid of that pattern, and we need some sort of global variable parameters concept, yeah. right? This is something that customers are asking for, so. AWS is really good at listening to customers, so let's hope that comes soon. Yeah, yeah, let's let's push for that. So, well, hey Ben, we've uh, of course we've we've talked for a good amount of time, and and uh, they're going to have to edit this down because you know Ben and I are talkers. But any anything you want to throw out last minute before we head out? Any shameless plugs? Uh, well, the, the only other thing I would say is worth mentioning is the potential for step functions with AI, things like training mm. models. Um, in local yeah. models and then chaining prompts and responses together. Yeah. Um, I think there's so much potential that you can use your workflows for, for kind of similar to what we were just talking about, right? Saving some kind of global state of your conversation, either in DynamoDB or in the, the workflow itself in the parallel state and chaining together these responses. I think it's a really interesting use case that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more and more how customers are doing that with step functions. So, so I've done some work around this, and, and right. you and know, I've talked about this, and and I was shocked because it could do lang chain, but replacing it with step functions was fairly easy, uh, hey. and just right. quick deal drag grab this context, and, and so so basically what what it is, you know, the, the question comes in, let's just say a chat by the question comes in, save the question to DynamoDB. Actually, I, I would go ahead and hit the LLM, uh, build the prompt something, hit, hit the LLM, and then I would save the question and the answer to DynamoDB. So mm-hmm. the next time it came through, you can say, look, I asked this and here was your answer. Now, uh, ask this. You can also use it to grab, like, do, do, uh, uh, the rag stuff. So you can call, like, we, uh, Kendra ha- can do indexes for you and, and embeddings and things like that. And so I had Kendra go and, and index all of, of, um, 
of uh, serverless land. And now I can ask a question and just have serverless land be the scope of info. Uh, so all three step functions. Uh, nice. The only time I rolled out, and this is interesting, the only time I rolled out to Lambda function was to create the actual prompt. I could have done it in step functions, but it would have just been a chain of passes to kind of get that to be all the right things. So it was just easier. And and this, and I think this is an important call out. It's common sense. I'm, people ask, am I anti-Lambda? No, I'm not anti-Lambda. I, I just think you use it for the right job, and that's one of them. So it's common sense of orchestrate business logic. There you go. So um, really good call up. And uh, yeah, that, the Gen AI, uh, it's, it's huge. So yeah. Uh, anything else? I would say if anyone's interested in seeing more things you can do with step functions, there's this awesome website called serverlessland.com. You can go there to serverlessland.com slash workflows. And we've got about 160 different patterns all built with step functions uploaded by customers and AWS experts. That's a great place to kind of jump off from and, and try things out, right? Yeah, and, and that's that's been Ben's baby. Ben Ben kind of created that and has done a lot of those, and, and you've done a great job around that. Super impressive. Uh, if if you're looking, uh, and I don't think you have your Twitter or LinkedIn up there, but look for Ben on on Twitter if you've got questions. He's uh, or me. I'm glad to help. But uh, Ben is literally a genius in step functions. He's kind of our resident expert. Uh, also, if you're in the London area and you're seeing this before May 14th uh, of 2024. We are having EDA Day, which is Ew. Event Driven Architecture Day, and in as as we've said quite a few times, uh, Step Functions is at the heart of EDA uh, in the orchestrating, uh, you know. And so, come check it out. We'll be talking quite a bit about that. In fact, uh, and I haven't even announced it yet, so I'll just say it here: we've got someone who will be doing what we just talked about, talking about doing. Uh, prompt chaining and, and that kind of stuff using step functions. Nice. Uh, so it's really cool. I just read the, the abstract and today I was like, yes. Uh, so, uh, definitely, uh, one of our essays, Uma, will be talking about that. So, uh, with that, uh, Ben, thanks so much for joining me for Unscripted here. I have my go-to crew, by the way. I don't know if you, nice. I'm just saying, I have like nine of these shirts, but yeah, you know, rent your color, so, man. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, all right. Well, with that, we're going to say goodbye. And again, thanks. And we'll see y'all later. Thanks, Eric. Bye.